All right, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. So the, the title of this session is Back to School, Modern Solutions to Education Reform, which is a little bit mysterious. There could be a lot of different directions you could go with that. If you went to the session yesterday with Bill Gates and Walter Isaacson, you got a little bit more of a hint of what it is. And the, the, the key theme here is charter schools. Uh, so uh, uh, we're going to talk especially about charter schools in New Orleans, uh, which is uh, one, one of the, the leading cities in, in this area. So after Katrina, uh, back in 2005, the city took over, excuse me, the state took over all the cities, almost all the city schools, eventually turned them into charter schools, uh, and, and has now uh, reunified the district. And so now the school district, the locally elected board, oversees uh, a system of all charter schools, and it's the first city ever to do that. So we have no traditional public schools uh, in New Orleans, a, a very unusual system. Bill Gates and Walter Isaacson were somewhat involved in that effort, which is why it came up in the conversation uh, yesterday. And so that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, you know, these reforms are interesting on a lot of different uh, dimensions. They raise a lot of fundamental questions about education. Uh, uh, about the role of governments and markets, about the meaning of public education, the, the role of private organizations uh, in that effort, uh, the roles that schools play in their communities and neighborhoods, uh, and really just about what we expect schools to do. What, what, are, we, what are we asking of them? So we're going to have a great conversation here. We've got a great panel uh, with, uh, with a, some, I think, un unusual panel in a couple of respects. One is that we've all written about these reforms, and at the same time, we all have kids who we've tried to navigate through this system. So we have both personal experience uh, and have, have thought a lot about it uh, in, in, at the same time. So let's kick it off. Uh, Celeste, let's, let's start with you. So you have the most recent book uh, on this, The Public Schools, Private Governance, uh, Education Reform, uh, and Democracy. Uh, so that title signals something about the interest uh, you have in it. You're a political scientist by training, uh, so the focus on democracy makes, makes a lot of sense. But why don't you kick it off and tell us uh, you know, what you think is most important to understand about charter schools generally and about what's happening in New Orleans. Sure. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming this morning. Um, well, as, as Doug said, uh, I'm a political scientist, and so, um, and I have two kids. And so when I began to navigate this system when my um, older child was uh, four years old and going into kindergarten, um, I thought, and it never occurred to me that we wouldn't go in, we wouldn't have our children in public schools. I'm a product of public schools. My husband's a product of public schools. Um, and I began to navigate this system. And I was struck as a political scientist by a whole bunch of questions about governance. Um, the sort of age-old question of political science really is who governs, um, and so meaning who gets to make the decisions in any sort of system, who has power, who's excluded, who's included. Um, and as I went from open house to open house looking for a school, um, I was struck by these questions of who is in this room at this particular school, who's not in this room, um, how does this system set up so that some people are included and others aren't, and who gets to have influence over, um, over the really important decisions about schools. And so what's important to know about charter schools? Well, um, I think one of the big questions is around what we think a public school is. Um, if a public school is a school that is publicly funded, primarily, then charter schools are public schools. Um, if a public school um, is a school that's not just publicly funded, but that um, has an ability for the public to have some influence over uh, the big questions about the kind of system, questions about maybe curriculum, about a whole host of things that we typically think of when we talk about school boards, um, then charter schools, those in New Orleans, because there's a lot of variation nationally, um, are not public schools. Um, they, the, the boards that govern charter schools are privately selected. Um, there is no real accountability. Uh, the parents, the community, the neighborhood, um, the, peop the, the residents, those of us that live in this city, uh, we have no ability really to influence um, major decision making when it comes to our charter schools. We have an elected school board, but their powers are pretty limited and pretty restricted um, by state law. And so um, that, those are the questions at the heart of my book. 
Um, how did the system become like this and how has it been maintained over the last 18 years? Thanks, Les. Uh, Ashana, so you're a, a parent af activist, social activist in the city. You talk to a lot of parents, and, I, and I've talked to you a lot about these reforms over the years, too, and I always appreciate your, your voice in this. So uh, what do you think is important here? What, what would you add to what Celeste said about uh, what's important about charter schools? Well, I, I guess it depends on the lens you're coming from. Um, so, when, so I don't have a book. Maybe I should. <laughs> but yeah, when yeah, people yeah. ask me um, what are the problems in New Orleans charter schools, I say, where do you want to start? <laughs> Which lens? So as a parent of a 12-year-old on the autism spectrum, um, parents with children with disabilities have a very hard time navigating schools in this city because they just simply, some schools simply won't take them, which is against the law, which goes back to speaking of accountability. Um, I often say New Orleans is the wild, wild west of schools because pretty much people get to do what they, as they choose. The school choice is the school's choice to choose not to educate your child legally and properly. Now that's not the case for all charter schools. There are some schools who are functioning wonderfully, but it's very few. Uh, the way, I, what is important for schools, I mean, as a, as a person who is a native New Orleanian, family from this city to like I have a, a great grandparent, 1806, right? So when I think of what's important to me, it is definitely more of a community-based school. I went to a school called New Orleans Free School, which was, we had no grades. We went on field trips every week, but it was a public school, very innovative. So after Hurricane Katrina, I really thought that we would actually maybe have innovation, more schools like that, more schools where it was best practices, smaller class sizes, um, more innovative, more technology. Um, I didn't think we would have less of everything. But what would be important is that our actual community voices are heard. Because of a lot of the things that people wanted I know, not I, I know, and statistics bear that if we had full educational institutions that educated children thoroughly, we had wraparound services, we educated whole children, our city would be different. The crime wouldn't be the way it is. We would have just more, we would attract more businesses. We would just have an overall better city and economy. So um, yeah, what's important is that Schools actually listen to community and stop deciding that they know better. Um, and I mean, uh, some of it is people who just don't know they don't know better because what they say, you don't know what you don't know. But others, it's just willful ignorance. And that's the part that as an advocate, you know, I often go into advocacy cases around with um, individual learning plans or 504 plans or even disciplinary hearings when I say, there's this new tool called Google you can type in best practices on your phone and it will come up. So I don't know that I can excuse it as much as I did prior because what, you don't know what an in-school suspension is. Literally, you can type it on your phone and it will come up magically. So, I mean, that's a lot of telling people what they should already know in order to be a principal, in order to be a CEO, in order to be a disciplinarian. Literally, that's what I do all day long, is tell people how to operate what they should already know how to operate to get the job that they have. <laughs> Thanks, John. Brian, so uh, you've, got, you've had a lot of different hats here too, right? So you've got kids, uh, had, had maybe had kids in the school. Um, you also wrote a book, uh, Only in New Orleans, uh, School Choice and Equity. You were a teacher in New Orleans schools. You were on a charter school board. What's your perspective on, on this? What would you add? The system in many ways has changed dramatically in terms of structure. There's no arguing that fact. Um, ultimately, educational change, and I'm stealing from former New York City Superintendent Anthony Alvarado here, but educational change is about what teachers know and can do, uh, where the rubber hits the road in classrooms. Um, and that is fundamentally what any structural change ultimately has to produce, otherwise it's spinning wheels, rearranging jack chairs, and those sorts of things. So um, when I focus on 
what happens with New Orleans public schools. I'm very interested in what happens on the classroom level. Uh, and in New Orleans, that's been heavily influenced by 15 years prior, uh, 10 years prior to our Katrina reforms, um, the advent of test-based accountability, which given the challenges our public school population in New Orleans has in, in meeting those test-based standards and, and are the standards in and of themselves things we would like our kids to hit? Yes. What has to happen inside the school for all students to meet those levels is tremendously constraining. There are kids who come to, to kindergarten at five years old reading short books. There are kids who come to kindergarten who don't know a single letter. Um, and those students require very different interactions. Um, and what has generally happened is because of the presence of test-based accountability over top of our charter reform, that that's, that's caused schools in many cases to chase test scores um, and to do things that will perhaps misserve their students in pursuit of test scores. And so what I've learned in some of my hats as both an educator, as a board member, uh, is that people want a lot of different things from their public schools. Um, from a politics lens, I think there's a predisposition to prioritizing things that are relatively easy to measure. <laughs> um, and so therefore, in the legislature, in school board meetings, um, we often prioritize the things that are important to us that also happen to be easy to measure. Um, but as a parent, that's, those aren't more important to us just because they're easier to measure. The other sort of intangibles of going to a public school, um, managing oneself in a room of diverse individuals, um, finding out about career interests, um, learning um, sort of the, the history of the place that you're from and being proud of that. All these things are things that are very important, learning another language, learning about the world. Um, but we have less good ways to measure them. Therefore, I think our system has been set up not necessarily to sort of hone in on those because they aren't rewarded as such. And, you know, my, my book was, had the word equity in the title. And, and often we see equity as closing gaps in achievement between students of various um, racial identities or socioeconomic statuses. Um, but equity also is hearing, validating, and working on goals of public schools that the community demands. Um, and we have a system that's set up to, that's not ideally set up to do that, I think, right now. And that, that presents a sort of next step challenge. All right. Uh, okay, that's a good segue. So uh, I also wrote a book uh, about these reforms a couple years ago called uh, Charter School City. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I focus on in the book is the effects on student outcomes, the easy to measure things that, that Brian talked about. Uh, so we found uh, you know, positive and quite large effects by, by uh, comparative standards to other kinds of programs on test scores, high school graduation rates, college entry, college graduation, uh, some evidence of reduced crime, and, and improvements on, for every subgroup that we could measure, uh, which surprised me, honestly, that, that, uh, that we found those kinds of effects. But it gets, it's related to the point that you're making about what, it is, what are we trying to do here, and to what degree do those uh, measures capture uh, what people care about. So Ashana, you know, back to you. So you, you talk to parents a lot about uh, these and you've had your own personal experience. To what degree do these measures matter or, or capture indirectly what, uh, what you think is important here? Well, I think that um, the majority of parents, when we send our children to school, because our children are in school longer than they're with us. And some children have to get up at as early as 5 in the morning to get on these buses because they can't get in a school close to their home. Like, can't, or the school is so low quality their parent won't send them. Because 76% of our children in this current system of systems aren't reading on grade level. And I hate it when we compare pre-Katrina to post-Katrina because all of the children who are in school now are all post-Katrina students. So we have to compare this system to itself not to before Katrina, but all that to say, as a parent, if I'm sending my child to you eight to 10 hours a day in a building full of educators, people who I assume are there to educate my child, the bare minimum is that my child be able to read, do math, understand basic social studies, who's the president, who's the vice president, 
you know, like I had when I was a kid, a bill is a bill, Capitol Hill. But we did have Schoolhouse <laughs> Rock. They don't have that. They need to bring that back. You know? <laughs> Schoolhouse Rock did help with that. It really did. <laughs> but, I mean, just those basic things. And I think a lot of parents are, first of all, we were made a lot of promises after Hurricane Katrina. One of the first things, and I remember being in multiple meetings where parents asked for schools to all have pools or access to pools to teach children how to swim because how many people drowned in Hurricane Katrina? We're in a city that's underwater, right? They wanted technology. They wanted our children to be able to go and work for Google or work for you know these tech companies, build apps. So we were promised all this innovation. There was a lot of innovation grants that came down. So there's two things parents are expecting, the bare minimum. If my child has a disability, give them services, teach them how to read, write, basic social, you know. And then there's the promises that were initially made to us, which is the reason we're doing this, the reason we're taking your schools, taking your names off the school, the reason your child has to get up at 5 in the morning is because we're giving them something better than you got, right? We're giving them innovation. You weren't edu you were educated in a school, and I was I was educated in a school with no AC. They had mice on the floors. But believe it or not, I had a better education. By the time I was out of second grade, I was writing in cursive. I knew my timetables one through twelve. I spoke my numbers in French and Spanish because that was all like required of our hot elementary school. <laughs> And I knew how to do see do because we had P.E., <laughs> right? I had to learn what rugby was, even though oh, God. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm clearly not going to be a rugby player. You know what I'm saying? If I was, I'd be a terrible player. You never but, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned these things. My child has not, neither of the three of my children, I have three children, so let me say that. I have three children. My oldest daughter is 27, 16, and 12. Young people do not do that. If you're going to have kids, have them boom, boom, boom. <laughs> that is a bad idea. Absolutely. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but literally, I had a better education in my unair conditions. Extremely poor. I had a better lunch. I had a better education. I had PE. We studied social studies than my children are getting. So a lot of parents are extremely disappointed in this system of systems. And when they do find a quality school, there's no, there's no guarantee that school is going to be open yeah. in four years. You get to know teachers and administration, and they're cycling out. They're constantly cycling out. There's a revolving door. Whereas before, like my mom knew my principal, my teachers. It was, a, it was a, more of a community school. Yes, we were educated on things that were cultural because the teachers knew the culture. I can't expect a teacher who doesn't know the culture to educate my child on the culture, right? So, I mean, a lot of things, not to say that I didn't have teachers from other places, because I did. I went to free school. I went to a school where my principal didn't wear deodorant. He said it was poisonous. <laughs> and they had very interesting parent meetings at his house. <laughs> so, but so <laughs> all that to say, the, the expectations of our community was this high, and then it got dropped to this low, and then even lower if you have a child with special needs. So what wound up happening was not only did we not get what was promised, but we didn't even get the bare minimum. Because a lot of times people talk about innovation and vision, and I want innovation and vision because I have two children who are currently in this system. But if we can get to law abiding and all schools having books and qualified teachers, I'll consider that a win. <laughs> so, so let's keep the conversation going about you know, the different things we expect schools to do. So another, another thing we, uh, we don't think about as much, we talk about the, the, the individual academic outcomes, but the schools also interact with communities and neighborhoods. So Celeste, you talk about this uh, a bit in your book. So, so tell us about that connection and how the choice system changed the, the connection between schools and communities. Yeah, well, one of the first things that went um, after Katrina was the neighborhood school. Um, and the idea of a neighborhood school um, has some problems, right? There are some disadvantages to a neighborhood school, largely tied to the way that we fund schools. So in a lot of places in the United States, 
Um, if you live in a wealthy neighborhood, then the public schools are well funded. If you live in a poor neighborhood, they're not. Um, and so many people have advocated eliminating neighborhood schools for, the, for that reason, on, based on equity. Um, what I would say is that the problem there is not the neighborhood school model, but our funding model and the way that schools are funded. And there's no, we can fund neighborhood schools in a different way um, that doesn't perpetuate those kinds of inequalities. And there are really important things that we gain with a neighborhood school. And I talk about this in my book. And, and I'll just talk about two things here today, because we have limited time and we want to take questions. But uh, one of these is uh, this, the, the social cohesion that comes with neighborhood schools. That the people live in the same neighborhood, they know one another, they rely on one another. Um, oftentimes the teachers come from that neighborhood. The, you know, there's, a, there's legacy that parents went there. There's an attachment to the schools, so the neighborhood goes to the football games or they listen to the band practice. And, and it, it is a part, it's an anchoring institution in that neighborhood. Um, and I talked to lots of parents for my book, and you know, one of the one of the quotes that stands out to me is that now, as parents, we're just sitting in a carpool line. That we go up, we drop off our kids, we pick up our kids, and that's the interaction. Maybe we go to a parent-teacher conference. You know, maybe there's one thing throughout the year, some kind of choir ceremony or you know, a, a holiday pageant or something, but. We're not involved in the schools. We don't know one another as parents. We don't know the teachers. We don't know the institution. And, and there's something lost there. Um, and, and so with neighborhood schools, you have a bit more of that. And that's very important. And the parents with whom I spoke talked about this over and over again, that this was how they grew up. This was an important part of their overall upbringing beyond the school, that the community itself was a part of the education um, of, of all of us growing up. The other thing, and this is something that I think is kind of overlooked when we talk about neighborhood schools, um, is there's a convenience factor um, with uh, for parents that have to drive across town or that have to put their kids on a bus at 5 in the morning. Um, and drive, you know, to drive across the river. The kid gets sick. You've got to, you got to take time off work. You've got to, you know, end your shift early to go and pick your kid up across town. Um, you don't know people enough to be able to rely on other people to help you out in that situation. Um, you can't go to the football games because it's across town, and lots of people in New Orleans don't have private vehicles. They have to rely on our sort of terrible public transportation system in the city. <laughs> Um, and so it makes it really hard to engage, and, it's, and, and we sort of often downplay convenience. Um, but the only thing I'll say about that is that um, there's, there's a gendered element to this, because for most of us, it's the moms that are doing a lot of this and that are sacrificing our shifts at work, that are sacrificing our careers, that are doing a lot of this work. Um, and that, I think, is just something that we don't spend enough time thinking about, that when we, we eliminate these neighborhood schools, um, that has ripple effects in a whole host of ways. Brian, you wanted to jump in on this? Yeah, I think one of the interesting experiences I've had has been in, in serving on the board of the Morris Jeff Community School that started, which um, very directly took on social cohesion function of schools. Um, that it's been an outlier in in many regards, I think. So that's probably true. But um, part of I, I don't think the existence of charter schools, in and of itself, precludes them serving as sources of community cohesion. What we did in New Orleans in 2006, in 2007, which was uh, selecting school leaders, having them build out a school model. Um, having them begin to hire their staff, and then locating them in a neighborhood willy-nilly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's destructive to social cohesion. Uh, we could have, if we were hell-bent on going the charter school route, uh, figured out where our schools were going to be, selected leaders that made sense in those schools, in those communities, had them know where they're going to be so they could build partnerships, hire local folks, and do that in a, in a much more uh, micro way. 
we didn't do that. Um, and so there has been, I think, serious damage to social cohesion at schools. Yeah, so I think that's an interesting comment because it gets to the question of like how you do this, not just whether you do charter schools, but how you do charter schools is, yeah. uh, is an important question. So let's, let's jump off from there, uh, Ashana. So if there's one thing you could change about the system, if we, ca if we were to keep the system the way it is, what's, what's the one thing you would change to make it work better? I would create an independent accountability system where people go in and actually observe. And even I would test um, CEOs and um, school leaders on stuff like um, educational law, SPED law, because a lot of them do not know it. And that is one of the biggest problems. And they don't know best practices, even though there is the handy dandy Google. <laughs> okay. Know. Okay. Celeste, how, what would you change? One, one, one thing. Oh. Um, well, I think we're, we're in a place where we can't sort of unwind everything um, too easily. Uh, and so, you know, my book talks about a few small ideas of things that we could change that would improve um, engagement, uh, would improve accountability, uh, and give parents, residents of neighborhoods, um, the citizenry of New Orleans more of a voice. And so there are things we could do about how we select charter board members um, that would be more inclusive of these voices. Um, there are things that we can do in terms of how parents select schools. Uh, we haven't talked about that, but one of the other big changes in this was that now parents have to make an active choice about where to send their children. Um, and there are a host of complicated aspects of all of this um, with the application to, to schools and the preferences that schools have and how this works. And um, there's a lot of confusion, I think, out there about how this works. And confusion tends to lead to mistrust. Um, but there are, there are ways I think we can make small decisions. Um, but really, the number one thing that I would change would be outside of the schools, and that is for cities like New Orleans to take poverty seriously. Um, you know, we can do a whole host of things within our schools in terms of teacher training and, and how people select schools and all of that, but um, if we still have a, have a city and a nation and a state where, um, you know, more than half the school population is impoverished, and there aren't good jobs for people to, to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to provide for their families if we don't have great infrastructure in terms of public transportation um, and medical care and all of these things that have ostensibly nothing to do with schools but have everything to do with the upbringing of our children and, and, and how successful they're likely to be in life. All right, let's, let's change gears. We are, by the way, going to be uh, opening this up to your questions uh, here at the end. So we have a microphone, and uh, I'm going to ask a few more questions, but just be thinking in the back of your head what questions uh, you might, uh, might want to ask, and then we'll have people queue up here at the end. You know, one other topic we haven't talked about, and this, I think, goes partly to how, how the system was put in place, but also where it might be going, and that is the role of race. And there's a, there's a, there's a divide in perceptions uh, and support for the reforms. Uh, you know, when, when, you know, after Katrina, there, it was obviously a very racialized event. It affected uh, you know, uh, black and poor people and hit them particularly hard. Uh, the, the way the system was put in place, it was put in place by you know, mostly white leaders, a lot of outsiders coming in, yet the vast majority of the students, the vast majority of the teachers are black. Uh, and, and so did, I think for, for these reasons and some of the, the things that have come up around the, 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 the selection of charter board members and so on, that uh, that has played out in terms of a pretty significant divide in terms of perception support for the reforms are, are fairly different uh, across racial groups. So as you talk a little bit about that in your book and you looked at polls on this, you did, did focus groups that involved that too. Say a little bit about that and I want to open up that question to others too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, your, your opinions about this district depend on where you sit, as do our opinions about most things. Um, but uh, in my conversations with parents, um, there, uh, what I expected to find when I talked to parents was kind of what happened to me, which was when I went through all of this, I became incredibly disillusioned and frankly enraged. 
um, and was, um, and, and I just thought, how can this be the way this is? And this has to have a, a, a devastating effect on people's uh, political interest, their, their willingness to engage, their belief, their efficacy, their belief in their ability to change things. Um, and that's what I expected to find. Um, and I found a little bit of that, but primarily among people like me. Um, in, the, in the black community, uh, the black parents that I talked to never had any belief that the system was going to work for them. Um, and so they weren't disillusioned because they were never illusioned, I guess. <laughs> um, they didn't, you know, the, despite all of the fanfare, there was a lot of optimism. There was a lot of hope. There was, you know, and Ashana talks about this. There was this sense that maybe things are going to get better now. There's a lot of money that came in after Katrina, and people had, a, you know, a, there was a lot of optimism. Um, but not deep core belief that things were going to improve for people like me. Um, and so no one was really surprised that the system perpetuates inequality, that some people have a much better shot at getting into the so-called good schools than other students. Um, it was just kind of a sense of, I'm going to do the best I can for my kids and my family. I'm going to assume that other people are doing that too and hope for the best, but really no, no real sort of core belief that, um, that anything was really going to change significantly for their communities. Brian or Sean, any, any additional thoughts on that question? Taking one step back, I think it's important to keep in mind that we are asking school systems to do things that they have never been asked to do before. When I went to school, we did not have standards. We did not have, we had two high school tests you took at the end of the school year uh, to get a little gold star on your, on your diploma. And if you didn't get them, you got the diploma without the gold star and everybody you know, went on their way. Uh, we have not asked schools to perform at this level um, ever in our history um, with the standards that we have to get universally students to meet them. Our system has warts, big ones. Um, but the, the sort of rising of the tide for all of our students to hit the level of the, what the standards are asking them to do has never really been done. And so the amount of support, the, amount, the, the, the support for teachers that's needed and leaders is tremendous, and we don't have that there yet. So it's really hard to blame the structure of our system for not working when we don't know, we don't know what the structure of a system would be that could get 100% of our students at grade level. That's an unknown. Martians would need to come in and tell us because we just <laughs> don't know. And so we, we fault our educators for not getting 100% of their students at level, um, but we certainly don't build systems or know how to construct a system to do that. Yeah. Ashana, any thoughts on that? Well, I have to challenge that by saying there's a, there's a whole bunch of books on best practices, which we could have tried, mm -hmm. but we never did. So um, after Katrina, we had way less poor and disabled children because they knocked down the housing projects, the big five. So we had a ton more money and a lot less students. We decimated the black teachers and middle class. We fired all of them and we replaced them with young people with four weeks of training for a traumatized population. To me and a lot of the parents in our community, it was like you were planning to create a disaster because this can't be rocket science that children who just went through extreme trauma lost homes, family members, and community, probably needed to be met with qualified teachers and therapists. Instead, they were met with metal detectors, armed guards, zero tolerance policies, and teachers with no training. Now, again, I'm not a rocket scientist. I do not hold a PhD. But if I was preparing to educate children who had just been through extreme trauma, the likes of which this country has rarely seen, I probably wouldn't meet them with armed guards, metal detectors, and barely trained teachers with scripts 
Because one, the, one of the other things you said is that the teachers, well, a lot of the teachers want to teach. They want the ones who actually are educated, but they're literally met with scripts and not given the tools to actually educate. So, and let me say this, that wasn't for all of the schools. Our school system is 83% African American. 84% free and reduced lunch. So our public school system is largely poor and black. 75% of the white students attend the five best schools. 76% of the middle class children attend the five best schools. Now we have a one app. Our algorithm is clearly racist, you know, and classist. Because it only puts white kids in good schools. <laughs> And a lot of black children are relegated to schools that give them silent lunches, no PE. That's right, they can't talk during lunch, which is a social emotional development skill that our children need to develop, not antisocial behavior. Because if you don't talk during lunch and you don't talk in class, no and you have no PE, you're gonna develop antisocial behavior, which is directly linked to criminal behavior. There's a bunch of best practices to deal with traumatized children, to deal with children in poverty. We don't implement any of them. So this idea that we've had 16 years to literally experiment on children, we still are acting like we don't know what to do but have never grabbed the old best practices manual for traumatizing children in poverty, have never listened to what the community asked for and implemented that. I don't actually think we're trying. The, the question becomes for a lot of parents in this community, and if you can, they will say, when I will say, is education working? They will say, yes, working for the actual goal. The goal is not to educate our children and have critical thinkers. The goal is to give low-wage employees to the tourism industry and places like Walmart. Because the Walton Foundation did give us a lot of grants, and nothing against the Walton Foundation, because I'm still looking for money. But also, y'all don't pay people a living wage. So why is it that you have some schools that have silent lunches for kindergartners, no PE, don't have qualified teachers, and then you have other schools that have theater and music? And why in a city that is musically, like uh, the spirit of our city is music and arts? So why wouldn't that be in every school? And then it helps with trauma. The study's out there. I didn't make that up. All right. So we're getting towards the end. So again, if you have questions, I would start queuing up now. I'm going to ask one more question, uh, a quick question of all the, the panelists. But go ahead and queue up if you have questions you want to ask. There's a microphone here in the middle. Um, so we've, we've talked uh, about things that we would like to change. What about something you'd want to keep? Uh, some, something. So it's a distinctive system. Is there something that you like? about the system that you would want to keep uh, and maintain, even if you might you know, do some of the other things differently or implement it differently? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the idea of innovation um, is intriguing. You know, what you were talking about going to a, a, a free school, you know, that there are, there are models out there that maybe we don't even know about yet because it hasn't been tried. And so a system that can foster that, I don't know that this system really fosters that because of the, the, the focus on test scores and performance. Yep. Um, you, those two things are in tension. It's hard to have innovation and then to have everybody have to meet the same standards. Yep. Let's go down the line, Brian. A, a school that is woeful, woefully underperforming over time doesn't get a right to exist forever. Uh, and that's an idea we should keep. Nashana? Okay. Jesus. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, a hard, that's an impossible question because we had innovation before this system. We had more innovation. I want to say an innovation thing, but that's not what we're doing. We had more of it before Hurricane Katrina. So I, I honestly, um, there are some people in the system I would like to keep. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, let's go to the audience, please. Good morning. My name is Karen, and I'm a recovering education parent activist from Washington, D.C. <laughs> and 
I grew up in Baltimore, went to public schools. My son was raised in Washington, D.C. and went to public schools, but my husband grew up here in New Orleans where he went to Catholic schools. And I'm curious as to what role the strength of the parochial school system played in this ease of dumping traditional public schools and going all charter. I think it, it's huge. Um, you know, any talk of reforming our system that doesn't take seriously the robust private school market um, is, is missing a critical piece. That whether it's the, the secular private schools or the parochial schools, um, I think, you know, and the majority of white families send their kids to private school. Uh, so that goes also into the racial element of, of all of this as well. Yeah, New Orleans has the highest percentage of kids in private schools. And I say private, I'm not talking about charter schools that are privately operated. I'm talking about private, you know, religious and secular schools in any city in the country. It's about somewhere between a quarter and a third of kids are in private schools. If like, you can afford better, you do better. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Hi, um, my name's Rory. I'm a longtime education activist from Philadelphia. And um, I think my question is, Something I didn't hear in this conversation is what do you all see as uh, being the role of teachers in education reform, in being anti-racist, in pursuing equity, uh, obviously other than teachers being the victims of bad policy? What, what is their role? So this is related to one question I, I didn't get to ask that was on the <laughs> list because we ran out of time, which is about, about teachers and how the teacher workforce has changed. And Brian, so I had a question listed for you about that because <laughs> being at UNO, you know, you're in a program where you're training teachers uh, and, and school leaders. Uh, you want to take that question or any, any version of that question? Yeah, I think much of the rhetoric around our, for, our reform was moving decision-making closer to students, right? We're going to not make them in central offices. We're going to make them in districts. However, uh, what that actually operationalized as was um, school leaders having incredible power and teachers having generally even less. Um, and that's not a recipe for success. So forming a way for, for the teachers to have increased decision making level at the local site, some of our one site teachers unions are examples. Um, I think that's the way forward. I think the teachers have to organize because especially the ones where they don't get bathroom breaks, that is against the, um, the law. Biological law. Next question. Good morning. My name is so Ethan. My question is to, the they've been calling you Brian, but you were talking earlier about yeah. the way that your organization works to make a charter school that is more focused on community, if I've been understanding you correctly. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that. Um, yeah, there's, there have been a few charter schools in New Orleans founded on probably what I call a community organizing model. Um, and so we had the dumb luck to have in our neighborhood people who were professional organizers, either through the Industrial Areas Foundation or other organizing groups that saw the post-Katrina reforms coming and said, this is either going to happen sort of to us or we're going to organize, mobilize, and create a school that sort of fits what we want to have. And that's happened in a few locations um, around the city. I will say that it was um, a lot easier to flex those muscles um, if there were white people in the room than if it was an African-American group trying to do the same thing. Thank you. Uh, so we've got just literally one minute. So we have two more questions. Could, could you just ask, both of you ask your questions quickly and then we'll see if we can get a quick response on either yeah. one of them. Um, I'm Aether, I'm a current student and hopefully a future educator and I wanted to know what you thought about uh, advanced studies academies where students test into essentially better schools. Okay, and Thank go you. ahead and ask your question too. Yes, I'm a retired public school teacher, and I want to thank you all, and I want to ask why this wouldn't be held on a Saturday where educators could come. Okay. <laughs> that is a great question. That is a great question, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the advanced model, I think, is like a magnet school model, um, and, and, and we have former magnet schools that are now charter schools, and so we, we have those schools in, in our system that you test into, um, and I think they're... They're a big part of what Ashana was talking about, where uh, you know, 75%, I think she said, of the, of the white families in public schools in New Orleans are in those schools that are selective admission schools. We are out of time, but thanks to the panelists and for the audience for a great conversation.